And welcome back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and these are, in my humble opinion, the top 20 cards from the year for Commander. Of all the Magic cards released this year, these are the 20 that I think are best for the Commander format. You know, and my rankings typically are, they tend to be cards that, first of all, fill a niche that maybe we need in the format or that we would like to have in the format. I always like cards like that. Cards that are doing very specific things that fit into a certain archetype or are really good for certain commanders. You know, I always love to see cards that all of a sudden you're going to have this very underwhelming commander that gets a lot better because of this card, which is always good. I already did my removal list, you know, and I did that list because there was so much fantastic removal this year. And I had left off even a lot of great spells off that list because there was so much re removal. I, I tried to have that list as diverse as possible with regards to different kinds of removal and also different colors of removal. Obviously, some colors are better than others at removal, right? And this list, I tried to keep diverse too, you know, all over the place, doing lots of different things in this list. Cards that I think for sure are going to be Commander staples for a long, long time. Like I said, this was a great year for Commander overall. So starting out with an honorable mention, Maskwood Nexus. And I got to give this an honorable mention because it is just such a unique card. Again, it's it's filling a niche. It, it is very niche, but it's also filling, uh, you know, it's very combo-tastic. There's lots of neat little things you can do with it. If you're in a deck where you really care a lot about creature types, obviously it's great. It, it you know, it's, it, it is very niche. I, it's not going to get played in every deck, but it's definitely a card that's going to see play in Commander for many, many years to come because of what it is doing. So I just got to give it a mention. But coming in at number 20 is the Meat Hook Massacre. X black black legendary enchantment when the meat hook massacre enters the battlefield each creature gets minus x minus x until end of turn whenever a creature you control dies each opponent loses one life whenever a creature an opponent controls dies you gain one life so i gave this the 20 spot on this list because it's definitely a good card no question about it man is it a little overrated though like this card is already like a 50 dollar card what the heck like when i saw that i was like huh uh, and I just, when I did my removal video, a couple guys are like, hey, where's Meat Hook Massacre in here? I'm like, that's not a great removal spell. Like for me, Meat Hook Massacre, like it's a great card. It's on my list for, for good reason. But as a removal spell, it's not great. You know, like it, it's, you're going to pay four mana and kill all the one ones and all the two twos. To me, this is a blood artist effect that also doubles as a okay removal spell it's it's not a great removal spell right if someone's got a Revoran Klex on the table I got to spend eight mana to get it off the table that's not very good you know uh I, I'm not going to put this this is not going to fill a slot in my deck for removal definitely not um and also I think it's very niche like I don't know why this is such an expensive card is everyone just throwing this in all their decks I don't know because I think this is a pretty bad removal spell and it, it, it goes in an Aristocrats deck, right? It's doing that Blood Artist uh, Zulapur Cutthroat thing. That's the deck that it goes in. And it does go in all those decks, right? All of the Aristocrats type of decks for which I made one recently and, and I wanted to put this card in there and I'm like, holy man, it's so expensive. Like, again, I don't know if the expensive is everyone's running out and buying it because they think it's the best card of the year or something. I think it goes in a specific archetype. I, I wouldn't put this in every deck. It's definitely a great card that we're going to see in the format for a long, long time though. Coming in at number 19, Saw It Coming. One blue, blue, instant counter target spell has foretell, of course, pay one and a blue. For me, this is the go-to now for, for my, like not just in blue deck, just counter spells in general. This is one of the first counter spells I'm going to put in a deck. Uh, you know, I like Swan Song a lot, but it's getting expensive. You know, it's getting real expensive. So if I make a new deck, do I want to spend the money on a Swan Song? I mean, maybe I do, but Saw It Coming is definitely going in there. Um, it's it's going in all my blue decks if in in the place of a counter spell and then you know I go down from there it supplants a lot of things if anyone's out there still playing cancel maybe or, or dissipate or something saw it coming is just straight up better in my opinion coming in at number 18 is probably my favorite card draw spell of the year which is stinging study for black instant draw x cards and you lose x life where x is the mana value of a commander you own on the battlefield or in the command zone so first of all, it, you're almost always going to get the card draw for this. It's very rare. Your opponent can bounce your commander in response. That's the one way to screw you out of this. If you have your commander on the battlefield and you cast this, your, your opponent can bounce it. And when it's in your hand, I mean, I guess you could send it back to the command zone if you don't want to risk 
yeah, you could just send it back to the command zone because it's changing zone. So I guess you won't get screwed there. But that that's the really the only situation. As long as it's in the command zone or on the battlefield, you're okay. And, you know, for me, I want to have at least a four. My, my commander, and of course, partner commanders is always great here as well, because you can have one that's a two, you're going to have a Thrasios, and then as long as you have one other commander that costs quite a bit, you can pick that one, right? Because it is a commander you own. So for me, I want to get at least four. I think five mana instant speed, I draw four card, lo- cards, lose four life is, is pretty fantastic. And then it only gets better from there. Like in my Selim Guard deck, this went right in there. I mean, draw six cards for five mana is amazing. Do you want to maybe be careful going too high though? You are losing the life, so you do have to be careful there. I really like to get some bang for my buck. I want to get like draw two cards is just so low, low impact. I want to I want to draw like four, five, six cards if I'm going to cast a one-shot spell that's drawing cards. I want to get some bang for my buck, and Stinging Study is definitely that. Coming in at number 17, Guardian Augmenter, and this is one that I was really high on when it came out in C21, and I keep forgetting to put it in decks. You know, a lot of my Underwhelming Commanders decks that I made, I think this probably, like the Sisters of Stone Death uh, deck that I made, this definitely should have gone in there. I think it's great if you really, really care about your commander, which a lot of decks do. Two and a green, Troll Wizard 2-2 has Flash, which is always fantastic for a commander card. And then on top of that, commander creatures you control get plus two, plus two, and have Hexproof. So the Flash and the Hexproof can play off of each other where your opponent is about to use a removal spell on your commander. And you can Flash this in and, and get them to waste their removal spell. So that's extra good. Just a great card. Gives your commander a, a bump and also Hexproof. A lot of decks want to be protecting their commander. Coming in at number 16, Conspiracy Theorist. One in a red human shaman. When Conspiracy Theorist attacks, you may pay one and discard a card if you do draw a card. Whenever you discard one or more non-land cards, you may exile one of them from your graveyard. If you do, you may cast it this turn. Again, this is very. This is filling a nice niche. I'm in a red discard deck, which there are a f- quite a few of those. It's a nice card advantage card in red, which I think red needs. You know, everyone's always going on and on and on about white not having card draw red doesn't have any either red's got impulse draw which can be good and can also be bad like typically the impulse draw you only can play it on your turn so once you you know get empty handed now the impulse draw is only letting you play on your turn on everyone else's turn you're just sitting there doing nothing right so this is great card advantage also for red i think as well where i can discard and draw and then the card i just discarded i get to play it so i'm basically drawing a card even if you just attack with your conspiracy theorist like in, in i'm gonna play this in a discard deck but i could even just play this in any deck and use my conspiracy theorist first ability to take advantage of the second ability. Coming in at number 15, Hullbreaker Horror, five blue, blue, Kraken Horror, seven, eight. Has flash and can't be countered. So again, great having flash and can't be countered in a commander game. Those are really great abilities to have on a creature, especially when it's expensive, right? Whenever you cast a spell, choose up to one. Return target spell, you don't control the owner's hand. Return target non-land, permanent to owner's hand. Just a really fantastic finisher. This is a card, again, it's already kind of getting expensive because I think a lot of people are like, okay, well, that's a great finisher in my mono blue or, you know, is it Spell Slinger deck? I'm throwing this in my Abishon deck because I don't really have much of a finisher there. I just attack with my creatures. So it's it's nice to have a big beefy finisher like this that can really control the game. It's just a great finisher for a Spell Slinger deck. And I think we're going to see this a lot in the format going forward. Coming in at number 14, Guardian of Faith, one white, white, Spirit Knight, 3-2. Again with the Flash, and I did not do that on purpose. There's a lot of Flash cards on here. I mean, Flash is great in the in the format, without question. When Guardian of Faith enters the battlefield, any number of other target creatures you control phase out. So just great board wipe protection. And in particular, it works extra good against the Cyclonic Rift, which of course everyone hates in the format. And... The reason why is because you flash it in in response to that Cyclonic Rift and phase out all your creatures. The Guardian of Faith doesn't phase itself out and then gets bounced back to your hand by the Cyclonic Rift, you know, or Evacuation or, you know, any of those types of blue effects. And then, of course, you get to use it again. So all your creatures phase in on your untap and then your Guardian of Faith is in your hand to to use again for the next one. So great card. Coming in at number 13 is Wandering Archaic, five mana, avatar 4-4 it has a flip side which i'll talk about first i don't know if anyone has ever used this or are going to explore the vast lands three mana sorcery each player looks at the top five cards 
of their library reveals a land card and or instant sorcery card from among them puts it the cards they revealed this way into their hand rest on the bottom of the library random order each player gains three life so a very huggy card it's weird that they put this on the back of wandering archaic i'm not sure what the story is there how those two mesh together the fact that it has a backside that you can maybe cast if you absolutely need to just makes it you know better than nothing right it, it does add a little bit to the usefulness of the card without question but the front side's really where it's at right five mana avatar four four whenever an opponent casts an instant or sorcery spell you may pay two if they don't you may copy that spell and choose new targets i just think this card is amazing in a commander game i'm really surprised it's not more popular strixhaven which was the best set this year in my opinion for commander this was my number one card from the set because it's colorless it can go in any deck it's going to just give you tons of free value. One of my least favorite phrases in all of Commander, which is, oh, well, they'll just pay two. Like, what? Yeah, just like Smothering Tithe and Ristic Study, right? Oh, they'll just pay for it. So those cards are terrible. No, they're not going to pay for it. They're not. Nobody wants to pay two mana every time they cast an instant or sorcery spell. They can, but they don't want to, right? So you're just going to be getting free value off of this. And the added bonus is... If I'm in a mono black deck, now my opponent cast a Beast Within or, or, or something, a Cross and Grip, or my red opponent cast a Vandal Blast, you know, something that I can't deal with, and now I get to copy it. Or my green opponent cast a Rampant Growth, and I can now ramp in a deck that doesn't do that very well. I mean, you're just getting so much value. You're getting to play outside of the box that you're, the color you're in doesn't normally do. I'm shocked this card isn't more in more decks. Like, I, I really am. I thought it was going to be in everyone's decks. It could be. This is a card you could put in anyone's in any deck. Um, I've got it in a few. Like, I'm trying to limit myself. I think this card's so good. Coming in at number 12 is Archaeomancer's Map. Two and a white artifact. When Archaeomancer's Map enters the battlefield, search your library for up to two basic planes cards, reel them, put them into your hand, then shuffle. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under opponent's control, if that player controls more lands than you, you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. So, as everyone knows, this is one of the best... Uh, white ramp cards I f I still think Keeper of the Accord is better like Keeper of the Accord is going to catch you up to everybody else which I really really like I like that it triggers on everyone else's end step added bonus it gives you a, a token as well this is probably second for me uh, as far as white ramp goes I mean you're guaranteed to get the two lands in your hand right one of the downsides to a lot of white ramping um, or, or just white land dig, whatever you want to call it, is a, lo a lot of them are conditional where you might not get anything. Like Knight of the White Orchid, which is a card that was used in Commander for a long, long time. I put in a lot of decks. I don't have it in any decks anymore. I don't know how many other people are playing it. It's a, kind of obsolete. There's a lot of times when I'd have that card in my hand and I wouldn't want to cast it because I didn't have any opponents with more lands than me, so it did nothing. It was just a 2-2 two -two, you know, with first strike for two mana. And I was like waiting for my opponents to put more lands in place so I could actually get some land out of it. You're guaranteed to get lands in your hand at the very least. And then, of course, when a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, which once you play this, it's very likely that the next three turns that your opponents take, they're going to play a land. So you're going to get those two lands you just got into play. So this basically turns into a better cultivate, right? Three mana, you know, I put two lands directly into play. So it's a better cultivate. I mean, it's definitely one of the best, maybe the best, white ramp card out there for sure coming in at number 11 is solve the equation two and a blue sorcery search your library for an instant or sorcery card reveal it put it in your hand and shuffle very simple this is just an an answer a solution right solve the equation a, a very fitting name i guess right it's just a solution for you to go get that answer you know to me i say it all the time about tutors tutors in my decks unless i have a very janky you know the stuffy dull deck the door to nothingness deck very specific sort of strategy that I'm working on where I need that specific card to make my deck work. My tutors are almost always going to be, I go get answers. I go get, you know, a Cyclonic Rift or I go get a board wipe, a, a return of dust, whatever the case may be. My opponent has, something's going on on the table that I have to deal with it or I'm screwed and I'm going to cast solve the equation to go get a board wipe or I'm going to cast it to go get, maybe I'm going to cast it to go get my stinging study. And, and so I can draw a bunch of cards, right? You know, I, again, this card didn't get a lot of buzz. I actually heard people say three mana tutor isn't very good, which, huh, you know? And I mean, in blue, like maybe in black, that's the case, but go get any instant or sorcery out of your deck. Seems like it's very versatile and you can put it in any blue deck and it's going to be good for you. 
Getting into the top 10, Harmonic Prodigy, another card that I was really high on. This was my number one card from Modern Horizons 2, one and a red human wizard with prowess. 1-3, if an ability of a shaman or another wizard you control triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. I mean, this is an, a panharmonicon for triggered abilities of your shamans and wizards. And I thought the, I put this in my wizard deck was pretty obvious. Um, and then, so it, when I did that video, my top cards from Modern Horizons 2, I went through all the shamans where I thought this was an auto-include. Still though, no one seems to be playing this card, so I'm gonna sell it some more. I mean, it's currently only in 7,500 decks. I mean, that that's a fair amount, but I think it could be in so much more. Like I said, like Atla Palani, for example, it should be in all of the Atla Palani decks. It, and that's 3,300 decks on EDH Rec because whenever your egg dies, you get to do that twice, right? You get to flip two creatures into play. That's amazing. But I already talked about most of the shamans where I think it's an auto-include. How about some of the wizard decks? Kaikar wins Fury. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one white. So now you get two spirit tokens. So even if you're doing the I combo off type of Kaikar deck, this is giving you double the tokens, which then you can sacrifice for double the mana. So it's giving you the more mana to storm off or whatever you might be doing in that deck. A Nivmizit Perun, it is, again, I think an absolute auto-include. That's a red wizard. Again, 4,200 decks. That's one of the most popular commanders in the entire format. Whenever you would draw a card, it deals one damage to any target. That triggers twice. That's a triggered ability. And whenever a player casts an instant or sorcery spell, you draw a card. That triggers twice. So they both trigger twice. It's just uh, absolutely dominant in a Nivmizit deck. I, I, I would imagine it should be in all of those decks. It's not. I mean, people could do as they like, but I think you're missing out on huge value here. How about a Nekusar the Mind Razor deck? That's a wizard, okay? At the beginning of each player's draw step, that player draws an additional card. That's a triggered ability. Your opponent's now going to draw two cards. You're increasing what your commander is doing by double. And whenever an opponent draws a card, it deals one damage to that player. That's also a triggered ability. So again, just like with the Niv-Mizzet, you're getting double the value. I guess you're getting quadruple the value because you're getting double the card draw and double the damage. Should be an auto-include in that deck. And again, that's one of the most popular commanders in the entire format. So I I'm just throwing it out there. But getting to number nine, Auric Lore Mage, two black, black human warlock. And it's a 3-3 and you can tap it to search your library for a card, any card, and put that card into your graveyard, then shuffle. If it's an instant or sorcery card, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. But I, I think that's likely not going to be the case. It could be if you're playing a Kess deck, right? Um, you know, Marin, Gitrog. I mean, how many commanders are there out there in black where you want to be putting stuff into your graveyard repeatedly? I, like, I've already, you know, since this card came out, put it in a couple of my own decks and at least a dozen decks. Uh, I've talked about this on, like, my Underwhelming Commanders videos and whatnot. Like, I, this is another card that I can't believe it's not getting more play. You know, I actually heard someone say, oh, well, just put Entomb in your deck. It's way better. Okay, but Entomb's a one-shot, right? First of all. Second of all, Entomb's a really expensive card. And third of all, it's one card in your deck. Entomb is one card in your deck. What if you don't draw it? You know, I, I always find it a really, really interesting argument when people say, Oh, well, there's a better card. There's a card that's better than this card. So that means that that card's unplayable. Guys, this is a singleton format. Okay, you get one card of each in your deck. If you could put four Entombs in your deck, I would understand. You can't. You can only put one. So Auric Lore Mage is Entomb on a stick that I can keep doing over and over and over again. And if you're in a graveyard deck, that's amazing, right? So give it a try at least. You know, I'm, I, can't, I can't believe I'm actually having to sell these cards like Harmonic Prodigy and Auric Lore Mage. I don't know, whatever. If you don't want to play it, that's fine. More Auric Lore Mages for me. Coming in at number eight is Academy Manufactor. Three mana artifact creature assembly worker. One three. If you would create a clue, food, or treasure token, instead create one of each. So again, this is another card that I was really high on when it came out in Modern Horizons 2. Had it very high on my list. And again, a card that I saw other people going, eh, it's okay. But I wasn't thinking right now. I With all these cards, I think in advance, right? I think... There's only going to be more shamans and wizards coming out that want their triggered abilities to be doubled. There's only more graveyard commanders coming out that want Orc Lore Mage in there. And as we've already seen this year, there's only going to be more commanders that are dealing with clue, food, and treasure tokens. And this is an auto-include in those decks, right? 
I have a Denic deck. Threw that right in there. Every time I create that clue token now, I get a food and a treasure token on top of it. That's just incredible value, right? It, again, I know people don't like me saying auto include, but come on. If your deck is doing clue, food, or treasure tokens, how is this not an auto include? Just incredible value. Coming in at number seven, overcharged amalgam, two blue, blue, zombie horror, three, three. Flash, flying, there's that flash again. I, I didn't do this on purpose. Apparently I got a lot of cards on this list that are creatures with flash. It's really good in commander. Has exploit, when overcharged amalgam, exploits a creature, counter target spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. You know, this card probably is a little bit higher on the list. This is a little bit subjective for me. I love this card. I love answers. I love being able to have a answer to what my opponent's, whatever busted thing my opponent is doing, and this answers all of it. Like I talked about in my Stifle versus Swords video, if you watched it, and that was just a thought experiment. Relax, guys. I don't think that Stifle is better than Swords to Plowshares in a commander game. It was just getting the wheels turning about. You know, a lot of the times there is that activated or triggered ability that is going to win your opponents the game or cause you to lose the game, and Stifle can solve that problem some of the times. Overcharged Amalgam is going to solve that problem all of the time. There is almost nothing that your opponent can do that an Overcharged Amalgam isn't going to solve that problem. I can counter a spell, right? But if your opponent already has a Aetherflex Reservoir on the table, you can't counter that, but you can counter the activated ability, right? So it's going to answer almost everything. And of course, you, you can exploit itself, right? Any exploit creature can exploit itself. So this just becomes essentially a four mana instant. For me, it's going in all my blue decks. I love it. It's fantastic. Coming in at number six, Cemetery Prowler, one green, green, wolf. 3-4 with Vigilance. So first of all, I just want to say, 3 mana, I mean, talk about Power Creep. 3 mana, 3-4 three, with Vigilance is re a really good creature. You know, throughout Magic, even by today's standards, I think that's pretty good. But it has two incredible abilities on top of that, right? Whenever Cemetery Prowler enters the battlefield or attacks, exile a card from a graveyard. So again, worst case scenario here is I play this. As soon as it ETBs, I get to at least exile some dangerous card out of a graveyard, even if my opponents then remove it right away. But if I can get some attacks out of it as well, now I can start exiling more stuff. And spells you cast cost one less to cast for each card type. They share with cards exiled with Cemetery Prowler. Again, I just, like, I love Graveyard Hate Index. There's just, you know, like I was saying about the Oracle Lore Mage, there's so many Graveyard decks out there that will just dominate you if you can't deal with their Graveyard. This only exiles one thing at a time, right? Typically, I want to exile your, my opponent's, you know, entire Graveyard if they're playing a Marin deck. But this will slow them down a little bit. And then the added bonus is my spells are going to cost a lot less. And once you exile a few things with this, now basically all your spells are going to cost one less. So, you know... If you got a green deck, you maybe find room for this. That you know, that's my stance on it. It's always going to be good. If you have a green deck, try to fit it in. Coming in at number five, which was my number one card from Innistrad Crimson Vow, and of course the cards that I had really high on the sets that I had really high, like Strixhaven, Modern Horizons Two, and Innistrad Crimson Vow, I did top twenty lists for all those because I thought they were all fantastic commander sets. This was my number one from that list. Even though maybe Cemetery Prowler's better, maybe Overcharged Amalgam's better, I guess I had three in a row from that set. There are maybe better cards from that set for Commander, but this is, you know, my favorite just because it's so interesting and in what it's doing. Also colorless. I always give the edge to a colorless card because it can go in any deck and it, you don't have to worry about missing out on the fun because you're not playing that specific color. So five mana artifact. Pay one and tap. Exile a creature card from your graveyard. Create a token. That's a copy of the exiled card, except it's an OO construct artifact in addition to its other types and has this creature gets plus one, plus one for each construct you control. It gains haste until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. I'm sure there's some people out there that are going to say, oh, activate only as a sorcery ruins this card because a lot of people seem to be saying that phrase lately. But I think this card's fantastic. It's tons of fun. There's lots you can do with it. You can play it in a Construct Tribal. Sure, why not, right? Um, you know, obviously the Construct that you're creating is going to be at, at the very least a 1-1 one, because one, you're going to control one Construct. I like it in an ETB strategy where I can exile my Reclamation Sage or my Eternal Witness and get that effect again. The fact that it is, you know, a 1-1 one, one with haste, don't really care. I mean, I can attack with it, but mostly I want the... ETB effect. It works great there. Just a great value card. You could put this in any deck, 
that has lots of creatures, right? You could put this in a deck where I have, I'm doing an aristocrats theme or I'm sacrificing my creatures lots. And once they go to the graveyard, you know, maybe I have a little bit of recursion or maybe I can exile them, create a token copy that I can then sacrifice, right? Again, you don't care about the one, one, you don't care about the construct. You just care about, I'm paying one mana to create a creature, right? If you think about it that way, that's actually really, really good. Pay one mana and tap to create a 1-1 one, one creature is a, that ability alone is really, really good. So just a lot of things you can do with it. I think it's a super fun card that, it, it, you know, going forward is going to find a place in a lot of decks. Coming in at number four is Esper Sentinel. And I, I actually just realized, you know, I, I talked about the, the sets that I thought were the best this year for Commander. My top four are all from Modern Horizons 2. I think I have six or seven at least cards on this list that are from Modern Horizons 2. So obviously, by default, I, I guess I think that Modern Horizons 2 is the best set for Commander this year. I was thinking maybe it was Strixhaven, and I did do my 10... So if you add in the 10 removal spells, maybe that could wiggle it in Strixhaven's way a little. Maybe not. I, I don't know. Um, I don't think any of the removal spells were from Modern Horizons 2, but... My top four on this list are all from Modern Horizons 2. Wow, what an incredibly impactful set. Obviously, Esper Sentinel is already seeing a ton of play in the format. It got a little bit more buzz than maybe it should have. You know, I, I was, I think I actually had this number four on my list for Modern Horizons 2. It's funny enough that the top four on this list are very similar to the top four on my Modern Horizons 2 list. Esper Sentinel, a little bit, not, you know, it's a great card, no question. A little bit, it suffers from the, you know, I, I got to come up with a name for this, the white gets card draw in ramp syndrome, right? When, whenever there's a card that comes out and there's another card that is not on this list that I'm talking about in my last list of the year that got an incredible amount of buzz and what I consider to be overhype because of this. Whenever white gets card draw in ramp, it, like it's a meme now, right? It, it's, it's a meme, this white needs card draw and ramp thing. I didn't think that was the case a year ago. I definitely don't think that's the case now. But whenever that happens, everyone just loses their mind. Oh my God, it's another white card that draws cards. Good. Okay. I mean, yeah, it is. But I don't know if it was as necessary as people think that it is. I'm not going to get it. And go watch my What White Does Best video. I'm not going to get into all that argument right now. It's a great card. It's number four on my list for the entire year. I have it in a couple of decks myself. It's an artifact creature, human soldier. I guess I should read it in case people actually haven't seen this card before. It's a 1-1. Whenever an opponent casts their first non-creature spell each turn, draw a card unless that player pays X, where X is Esper Sentinel's power. So the downsides here is whenever they cast their first, it's only their first and only non-creature, right? I know everyone's loving calling this guy Ristic Buddy, which is a, is a really... That, that's a funny name for sure. It's not nearly as good as Ristic Study, obviously, because it's only the first spell and it's only non-creature spells, right? Uh, Ristic Study is all spells, obviously, so that's just bananas. So your opponent can just pay one when they cast that mana rock at the start of their turn, and then they're good to go, right? It is on every other turn, though, too. So if that same opponent cast a counter spell or removal spell the next turn, again, it, it, it resets, so they have to pay the one again. And you can bump up your Sentinel's uh, power. Like I said, you know, when I first talked about this, I thought it was particularly good in like a Boros or an equipment deck where I can throw a Sunforger on this. Then it's five power and there's no way my opponents are paying five mana. They're just going to let me draw the card. You know, as far as a card draw card goes, it's pretty good. Um, and for one mana, sure. Yeah, I'm going to put this in a lot of decks. I don't think I'm going to auto include it in all my white decks, though. That's just me. You know, you could. For sure. It's definitely a fantastic card, and we're going to see it in the in the format for a long time to come. But coming in at number three, another artifact creature, and that's right. I think this card is better than Esper Sentinel because I think it goes in more decks, right? It, for me, it's a lot of it is, some of it is I'm filling a niche, and some of it is here's a card that just goes in every deck, right? I mean, how do you rate Soul Ring? Of all the cards in the format, where do you rank Soul Ring? Most people would rank it number one because it goes in every deck, right? It's, that's a huge selling point for a card. Ornithopter of Paradise, as I said, when I did my ranking for Modern Horizons 2, you know, I had it really high on that list also because I'm just like, okay, well, this is just going to go in every deck, right? The, the format is moving towards two mana, mana rocks, you know, a lot of the three mana ones like Darksteel Ingot, 
Even Coalition Relic, you don't really see much anymore. This is an artifact creature, though, which holds it back a little, right? So it's, a, and again, holds back Esper Sentinel a little as well. You know, I'll also say artifact creatures die very easily in this format, of course. Artifact creature Thopter, O2, has flying. I like, you know, as much as it is a little bit of a downside that's a creature, it can also be an upside, right? So, for example, in my Danic deck again, I'm going to put this because it is a creature. So if it dies, I get that clue token, right? A lot of decks, you know, I had just thrown this in my Shanna deck because it's a mana rock. Like I take, I took out my Thought Vessel and put that in because it's a creature and Shanna cares about the number of creatures I have. So a lot of decks will benefit from that. If you have an Alibu deck, this can be that artifact trigger that you need, right? I can attack, even though it's an O2, I get the artifact creature attacking trigger of my commander just by attacking with this. I don't have to deal any damage. I just attack, it has flying too, so I, I probably won't be blocked. I attack with it, get that trigger. So it's great. It's it's actually can be a little bit of a benefit, the fact that it's an artifact creature. Also is a little bit of a downside. Obviously it's gonna have a summoning sickness, so you can't use it right away. I don't find that to be much of a drawback. The my mana rock comes into play untapped so I can use it right away scenario. You know, I would say most of the time that isn't a huge deal. Like a lot of people will play their, you know, Boros or, or Azorius Signet turn two, but it requires one mana to use so you can't use it right away. So typically that's not a big deal. I think just playing this on turn two and then after that you can use it as you want. It adds mana of any color. So for that reason, I think it actually trumps a Thought Vessel and a lot of those other cards. Speaking of Mana Rocks, though, Liquid Metal Torque, two mana artifact again. And, and you know, just, just like I said, Thought Vessel, I'm taking Thought Vessel out of a lot of my decks and replacing it with this. Taps to add a colorless mana. So again, that that to me is makes it worse than Ornithopter of Paradise. However, tap to turn target non-land permanent into an artifact in addition to its other types until end of turn is just such a fantastic very usable ability. I'm going to put this in any deck, probably where I can remove artifacts. And I had even started to consider putting this in a mono blue deck because you have Raven form and Resculpt and blue can't deal with enchantments. So if I put this in my mono blue deck and I'm still on the fence of whether or not I want to take Thought Vessel out of my Abishon deck to put this in because, you know, there is the maybe fringe scenario where my opponent has a really troublesome enchantment that I can't deal with and I can I do have my raven form in my hand and I can turn it into an a artifact and then exile it but in a mono white mono green or mono red deck absolute auto include in my opinion cuz those colors deal with artifacts really really well right even in a deck like uh, you know a, a mono white deck where it deals with everything really well creatures artifacts enchantments I still can do Return to Dust. I'm going to exile my opponent's artifact that's troublesome. And also, I'm going to turn their Vorinclex into an artifact and exile that as well, right? So it's even worth putting in there, even though in a white deck, you do have lots of options. But why not give yourself more? And then in like a mono green deck where I don't deal with creatures very well, now I can cast Force of Vigor or Cross and Grip or whatever and get that really troublesome Vorinclex off the table or Elishnorn or whatever, where in a mono green deck, you know, I might not be that good at dealing with creatures. And then in a mono red deck, like this can't be more, like how is this not in every mono red deck? I mean, red deals with artifacts really, really, really well and doesn't deal with enchantments at all. And, you know, it has a lot of issues with stuff like that. I just, how do you not put this in your mono red deck? I turn, again, that that Elish Norn, which, you know, maybe even an Elish Norn is, is a trouble for a mono red deck to get off the table. I mean, you got Blasphemous Act, Chaos Warp maybe, right? Like, th there isn't a lot of ways for red to get really big creatures off the table as well. So, you know, you have that issue to deal with, and then the enchantment issue, which I think is a huge one. There's a lot of enchantments in the game that will just completely shut you out if you don't get them off the table. And this is a way for Red to deal with that. But coming in at number one for me is, uh, you know, another card from Modern Horizons 2. Like I said, the top four on this list are all from Modern Horizons 2. It's Dothy Voidwalker, Black Black, Dothy Rogue, 3-2 with Shadow. And like I said about the Cemetery Prowler, I mean, a two mana, 3-2, that is essentially unblockable. That on its own is really good. I don't know how much you want to be attacking with this, though, because of the fantastic ability that it has. So first of all, if a card would be put into opponent's graveyard from anywhere, instead exile it with a void counter on it. So I was super high on this card originally because I thought this is one of the best graveyard hate cards around. You know, it's it, exile it 
if it goes into the graveyard from anywhere. So again, that Auric Lore Mage, I take something from my library and put it directly in my graveyard. That's going into the graveyard from anywhere, right? So it gets exiled. If I mill myself, exiled, you know, there's it completely hoses a graveyard deck because there is no way for you to get cards into your graveyard if a Dothy Voidwalker is in play. This has completely shut me down. Like this card is even better than I originally thought after playing with it, right? This list, you know, I, I've compiled it after actually playing games out there in the wild where I'm playing against these cards and also playing with these cards. And the last ability here, which I thought, oh, it's that fun, gaunty ability where I get to steal something of my opponents. No, it's way better than that. It's actually more like the wandering archaic ability that I was talking about there. Tap, sacrifice Dothy Voidwalker, choose an exiled card an opponent owns with a void counter on it. You may play it this turn without paying its mana cost. And again, this is an ability that you look at and go, oh, well, that's fun. I get to steal something of my opponents. No, when you actually play this in a deck out there in the wild, you realize that it's way better than you actually think it is. Because again, just like with the Wandering Archaic, it allows you to do things that your deck normally wouldn't be able to do. I played a game where I put this out turn two in a mono black deck. Next turn, my opponent casts a Rampant Growth. It goes to the graveyard after it resolves and, of course, gets exiled. So now there's a Rampant Growth in exile with a Void Counter on it, and I'm like, hey, I'm kind of mana screwed here. I can just cast that Rampant Growth on my turn, and that's what I did. You know, it actually saved the game for me. Even though I would rather have had my Dothy Voidwalker in play for a lot longer, I needed the ramp. So on my turn, I sacrificed my Dothy Voidwalker to cast a Rampant Growth and put a land into play. On top of the fact that it absolutely hoses graveyard decks, being able to, that that effect of I can do things outside of of my typical color pie is also great. And it's a sacrifice effect. So in a Lurus deck, I can now play this from my graveyard and use it again. You know, I can recur this. Any, Any sort of deck where I have a recursion theme, I can keep using this over and over and over again. Just an amazing card, you know, and it started out as like a $30 card, I think, when it first came out. Now it's down to about 9 or 10 so I don't know. You know, how many people are playing this? Maybe I should keep my mouth shut about some of these cards, but, you know, I'm recommending cards that I think are unbelievably good in a commander game. All of the cards on this list, I think, are great in a commander game. Some of them are more niche. Some of them are more, you could put them in any deck, like a Dothy Voidwalker or a Cemetery Prowler or an or a Overcharged Amalgam. I think those cards you could put in any deck and they'd be great. Liquid Metal Torque, Ornithopter Paradise, two of the best mana rocks, I think, in the format right now. Some of them are a little more niche, but are going to see a ton of play because they fit into that particular archetype that, that are, they're really going to give a lot of help to, right? Like Hallbreaker Horror or something like that. So that's my list. What did I miss? I'm sure it was a ton, right? And and again, remember, no removal. I did my removal list already, like By Invitation Only and Infernal Grasp. And those cards are some of the best cards of the year, I think, as well. But I already did my removal list. And I do have a list coming out of 20 cards that for me flew under the radar. They're cards that I never mentioned on any of my lists this year that I think are definitely, you know, and and some other people did. They flew under the radar for me and flew under the radar for a lot of people. I saw a few other content creators mentioning some of them, but I do have a underrated list coming out or under the radar. I'm not sure exactly what to call it, but I do have one more best of the year list coming out. Everyone must agree that all the cards on this list are great. And then there's so many more that I probably could have gave a mention to. So comment below what you think I missed, but that is it for today. And thanks for tuning in.